on other things. I tell you, every time I've ever preached on hell or if I've ever preached on the devil, the Lord just gives me, I mean the Lord don't, but uh, the devil gives me a bad time and, and uh, no rest and, and uh, things like that. But I know, I know who's behind it and I know what's going on, but uh, it's still... Uh, it lets you know that it's a heavy subject, and it's things that needs to be talked about. And so this morning, as you see, we're going to preach on there's no place like hell. There's no place like hell. And uh, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. And we're going to approach this a little different than we usually do, but I want to show you some things in Luke chapter 16. And this is going to be more of an education about hell because the world has its own way of describing things. And the world would like you to think that hell's just like any other place. But the, there's no place like hell. Amen. And the hell is not somewhere where you want to go or desire to go or that you ought to fit yourself to go to. Uh, hell is real. And so we want to talk about that this morning for just a little while, and then we'll let you go. Amen. Luke chapter number 16, look in verse 23 and 24. And I want to deal mainly from these two verses right here. The Bible says, I, well, let's jump up to 22. Let me cover from there on. The Bible says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham... Have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we need you today. We need unction today. We need uh, everything that you can pour out upon this service, God. We need that. We pray that you would direct our lips. We pray that you would help those that are here to have a right way of hearing this morning. I pray, God, that you'd overrule the demons of hell today and make them leave. I pray, God, that uh, you'd have the preeminence in the service. And I know that there's people here that need to be saved this morning. I pray, God, that you'd show them how much you were willing to do uh, to get them to heaven. Thank you for everything you do. I pray, God, that you get the glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like for you to ask yourself some questions this morning. First of all, is there a literal burning hell? We're going to answer that question. Is there a literal burning hell? Most people's idea of hell is just going through a rough patch. Most people's idea of hell is a place to party and uh, it's a place where bad people go and gather together in their badness. But you need to ask yourself a question this morning. Is there a literal burning hell? Then you need to ask yourself, am I going there when I die? Am I going there when I die? If the answer is no, the question ought to be asked, what do I base that upon? If you're not going to hell, there's a reason you're not going to hell, and you need to know that reason. Amen. Thirdly, ask yourself this question, if I went to hell, could I escape it? If I went to hell, could I escape it? Friends, I'm not going to answer this by opinion. I'm going to answer it by the Word of God. And the Word of God is the authority this morning. So you ask yourself those questions. I ask myself those questions and I'm not going to hell and I have a reason why I'm not going to hell and I'll never have to escape it because I'm, I already did. And so I want you to ask those questions. Psalm chapter 9 verse number 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. You see, it's a place. And all the nations that forget God. Matthew chapter 22 verse 13 says, Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark chapter 9 verse 44 says, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. 
Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 41 says, Then shall he say unto th also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, this world is hypnotized and in a trance. And they're so wrapped up in the world and its, and its value that they don't even realize there's coming a day when they're going to be accountable for their soul. Honest, we got people walking through this world and do not realize that one day, and it could be very soon, it could be within 24 hours, it could be next week, it could be a couple of years from now, you could find yourself laying on a deathbed and with, within minutes, within, within minutes of going off into eternity. This world thinks that uh, one day we'll just burn up and annihilate and that'll be it. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The Bible plainly says there's a hereafter. There's something that we're going to after we die. And so, uh, people will say, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in any of this stuff. I don't believe in the church. We had a man tell us, he, did, he thought he was saved, but he didn't believe in church. Didn't believe in the, don't believe in the Bible. Don't believe in any authority. But you know what's strange? When you get them on a deathbed, all skepticism leaves. Used to be an old saying. Some of you old uh, soldiers know the saying, there's no atheist in foxholes. When a man comes to die, he wants there to be something there. I'm afraid that if you wait till you die, it may be too late. And what you'll find is a place called hell. Amen? There's a term in the Bible, it's, it's called forever and ever. This means eternity. This means that for trillions and trillions and trillions of years, after you've been in that place, it'll still just be a little while and eternity is yet to spend there. Amen? And I, I read this after somebody. He said, imagine all your sins like a pack of hungry wolves chewing on you for eternity and eternity and eternity. Hell is a real place and there's no place like hell. Everyone who has sent away their day of grace, the moment that they hit that place, the very moment, they'll wish they'd never said there is no place like hell. There is no hell. There is no eternity. There is no God. They wish they could take those words back. Now, Satan uh, gives gifts to his false prophets. And they preach in their false churches and they tell false things. I, I don't mind naming names. I hope you don't mind, but it's too late if you do. There's a man named Joel Osteen that has a church of some 30, 40,000 people. You believe that? 30 and 40,000 people. And he says there is no hell. There's no need to preach on it because there is no such place. Now, Brother Gary, I, I wouldn't want to go to hell on my own. But I sure wouldn't want to go to hell sending 30,000 people there. You say, well, he's not accountable. Oh, yes, he is. Amen. They're still going to go there and they're still going to pay for their own sin for eternity. But he's going to be accountable. I ain't going to get into this today. The Bible talks about degrees of hell. Amen. There are degrees of hell. You are more accountable in areas. I'm accountable for the preaching that I do. Amen. Amen. And so Satan arms up his Joel Osteens, his false prophets, and this is what he gives them. Hell is only what you have in this life down here. Okay? Luke chapter 16 answered that. There was a certain rich man. In his life down here, the Bible says he fared sumptuously every day. He, he dressed in purple and he fared sumptuously every day. And in this life, he was called a rich man. But the Bible goes on to say that in hell, he lift up his eyes. 
He didn't have in hell what he had on this earth. And what you have on this earth is not what you're going to have in eternity. Somebody said we don't see them uh, dragging their U-Hauls to the gravesite. It wouldn't matter if they did. I heard of a man one time that was buried in his Cadillac. That's stupidity. His Cadillac's not where he is, whether he's in heaven or hell. We don't drag what this world has to offer with us into the eternity. And so the Bible plainly says that he was rich here, but he was not rich there. Hell is completely burning up, number two, and then it's over. Luke chapter 16, verse 23, And hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Luke chapter 16 verse 24 says, For I am tormented in this flame. Every man that has ever told that lie will wish he could untell it the minute he gets into hell. Hell is not, listen, the Jehovah Witness wants you to think that hell is just burning up and it's over. Hell is the grave. The Bible plainly tells us that there was a certain rich man. It's not a parable. It's a truth. And the moment that he hit hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Thirdly, listen to this lie. In hell there's no conscience. In hell we we won't know anything. Listen to this. The Bible says in hell he lift up his eyes. He realized he was in hell. You know why I know that? He called to Abraham and said, I'm tormented in this flame. I need a drop of water to cool this tongue. That's conscience state, by the way. He also knew that his brothers were headed there and tried to get Abraham to send somebody, send Lazarus from the dead to get his brothers. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. There's a conscience. I believe it's a worse conscience. I believe it's a conscience that will never leave you alone. And everything you ever did, can you imagine what Hitler is suffering right now? All the people he killed, mercilessly killed. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of those people were lost Jewish people and are in there with him in hell. And he sent all those people to hell. Can you imagine what his conscience is today? Here's a good lie that the devil gives people. There's a purgatory. Between heaven and hell and that is where souls go to be cleansed and then they can be prayed out of there and put into heaven. Listen to this. Luke chapter 16 verse 26 And beside all this, between us and you is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Purgatory was created by the Catholic Church in the 4th century. They met Augustine. Augustine, who also came up with the damnable doctrine of of, uh, hyper-Calvinism. Augustine came to them and said, well, let's do this purgatory. You know why? You know why they done that? So people could come and give them money to pray their family out of purgatory. There is no such place as purgatory. Purgatory is not in the Bible. It's a lie from Satan. Abraham told him, you cannot come to them and they cannot come to you. It's a lie. But you know, 30,000 people are going to hear that lie. We went in the Philippines, we went to a Catholic mass in the Philippines and there was 5,000 people there praying for people who had already gone on and trying to get them out of purgatory. A place that doesn't even exist. The fifth lie. People who go to hell can come back and forth and talk to us. Luke chapter 16 verse 27 28 said then he said I pray thee therefore father 
that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that they may testify unto him, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said, we're not sending anybody from the dead over there. If one went from the dead, they wouldn't believe him. And we cannot listen to me. Your loved ones that are in hell are going to be there eternally, forever and ever, the Bible says, and they will not come out of there to talk to you. They're not coming from heaven to talk to you. They're where they are eternally. And that's where they're going to stay eternally. And so there's your good five lies that the devil likes to tell folks to keep them confused so that they might go there one day. Now, the Lord took care of those lies in Luke chapter 16. He answered every one of them in Luke chapter 16. He gave you an answer for every one. Now, let's look at this place that there's no place like. There's no place like hell. Number one, there's no darker place than hell. Listen to this scripture. The book of Matthew gives us a couple of ideals and three warnings really Jesus gives about hell. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 13. Then said the king unto the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 25 verse number 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you about the darkness of hell. First of all, the Bible calls it an outer darkness. Why does the Bible call it an outer darkness? Because it's outside of all light. There's no light there. There's no souls being saved there. There's no souls being offered a second chance there. It's outside of all light. It's an outer darkness. It's a place where we can't even go to or find. It's a place out of outer darkness. Now, you say, what does that mean? It means that... It's uh, outside of all natural light. There's no sunshine. Isn't it pretty today? Walked out this morning, feels like fall. The sunshine is pretty. The breeze is blowing. There's no light there. There's no natural light there. There's no man-made light there. You can't turn on the light. You can't flip on the switch. There's no spiritual light there. There's no God-given light there. It's outer darkness. It's outside of any kind of light. Amen? It's outside of all the light of the gospel. It's outside all the light of hope. It's outside all the light of peace. It's outside all the light of pardon. Nobody's ever been pardoned from there. For had they been pardoned from there, God himself would have to enter in and there would be light. There's no light there. God casts people there. He don't dwell there. And it's a place of outer darkness. Jude verse one or, or uh, Jude verse thirteen says this: raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is uh, reserved the blackness of darkness, forever. It's it's not only an outer darkness, but the Bible calls it a blackness of darkness. Now the Bible gave us some examples of that. Two places in the Bible we find God placing judgment upon the earth where blackness of darkness was given. The first place was in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 10, verse 21 and 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, and there there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Now listen to this. Even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now here's a darkness that God talks about as he's trying to get the children of of, of Israel out of Egypt. He, He sends a judgment upon the earth that was a thick blackness of darkness so thick they could feel it so thick that they could not even move now Calvary Luke chapter 23 verse 44 and it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour 
Jesus was dying on, our, on that old rugged cross, the cross that we deserved. And he died in our place and took our hell. He didn't go into the depths of hell. He took our hell on this earth. And God turned out all the lights and that thick blackness of darkness was there. Now, friend, I'm going to tell you something. I've been in places where I could, where I could not see my hand in front of my face. But after a little while, my eyes began to adjust and I could see just shadows. I've never been in a place where I could feel the darkness. I've never been in a place like that and thank God I'll never be in a place like that. But the Bible says it's a place of darkness, outer darkness and thick black darkness. There's no lonelier place than that place called hell. There's no lonelier place than that place called hell. Did you know I spent 29 of my years, my years, this is how stupid I am, thinking that one day I was going to go to hell and party with all my buddies. And I'd tell people that. I was going to go where my buddies were. I was going to go where my classmates were that died before I did. Had many of them die. Had many of them die drunk, driving cars, driving motorcycles, died. And split hell wide open. And I'd tell people that's where I was going to go. But can I tell you hell is the loneliest place. It's not a place of partying. Listen, we're probably, I don't know, I think ACDC made a comeback. I wish they'd get out of the business, but... I, I went to the last concert that Bon Scott sang in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm not proud of that. This is what happened. I was there. A few months later, he recorded an album, Hell Ain't No Bad Place to Be. He had a song called I'm On the Highway to Hell. All my friends are there. We're going to party and all that. He finished recording that song, Hell Ain't No Bad Place to Be got in his car with some pills and a bottle of whiskey and went down the road and he found out in a matter of hours he died on his own vomit that hell was a bad place to be. Now, ACDC, when you watch them today, their very next album was called Back in Black. You know why? Because they found a man that sounded just like Bon Scott. He looked like Bon Scott. You would think he was Bon Scott. You know what they told everybody? This is Bon Scott come back out of hell. Their first big song was Hell's Bells. You got me ringing Hell's Bells. Is that what you want your children to listen to? Is that what you want to believe? Because it's all lies. There's no lonelier place than hell. People that are in hell are not partying. The rich man was not there saying, all these people, he said, I am tormented in this flame by myself. You're going to be lonely for your loved ones. Husbands separated from wives and wives separated from husbands eternally. They live together maybe here 30, 40, 50 years and yet they're separated because one went to heaven, one went to hell. And if they both go to hell, they'll not get to see each other ever again. Children with parents. Parents in hell not able to see their children. Children in hell not able to see their parents. Listen, there might be a, a young person right here this morning. Your parents are saved and on their way to heaven. Your grandparents are saved and on their way to heaven. But if you go to hell, you'll never see them ever again. Amen. Separated. Because hell is a lonely place. All your friends are gone. Everything is gone. Everything you knew is gone. Not only that, Brother Don, sometimes I can have a bad day. And I do have bad days. You have bad days. We all have bad days. And there's things that bring me comfort. You have some things that bring you comfort. Those are gone. You don't have anything that will bring you comfort. 
What are those things? What about music? I can, listen to me. Sometimes I can get in a place where I can just put some good godly music on. Brother Gary used to talk about coming home and putting Lester Roloff on, listen to Lester Roloff. Buddy, that'll pick you up. It'll bring you comfort. It'll give you, it'll give you a, a, a new a day. But those things aren't in Listen, there's going to be millions and millions of musicians in hell, but not one bit of music. No comfort. No music there. Amen? All of our natural comforts are gone. No music. No soft touches. Every now and then I can be having a bad day and my wife can just touch my hand and, and it, just, it just works. Or she can just speak to me and, and that soft voice will help me. Amen? That's all gone. Nothing there. No babies cries. No babies giggles. No babies laughing. No babies at all. No flowers there. No mountains there. No cool water there. No cool breezes there. Everything's gone. Hell's a lonely place. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. Thirdly, there's no more restless place than hell. Revelation chapter 14 verse 10 The same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Imagine a place where there's no rest. Imagine a place where when you get as tired as you possibly can be, there's no way to rest. Day and night. Night and day. No rest. Place is not, hell is not a place where you can rest. There's no peace found there. There's no rest in hell because it's a separation from God. What, where is rest found? Rest is found with God. Rest and peace is found with God. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden... My burden is light. Jesus said, Come apart and rest a while. He giveth his beloved sleep. Hebrews 4, 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Hell is a place where there's no rest. It's a place of restlessness. Listen, I've got a condition called restless legs. Anybody have that? You say, well, that's not bad. You ought to have it. You, you get, it, it's, it's the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. It's worse than a headache. It's wor worse than a toothache sometimes. You sit there and your legs just jerk and you can't, there's no rest. You feel like you're just going to die. You imagine your whole body being in a condition where you cannot rest. It's just twitching and writhing and terrible. It's a terrible place. You say, preacher, you're painting it up bad. I'm not painting it up. I'm telling you what the scripture says about it. Amen. If you could really see it, you'd know what hell was. Secondly, there's no rest in hell because of the torment of sin. Listen. Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. I believe this. I believe you'll know every sin you ever committed be brought up to you every day. The Bible says it's like the sea that brings up mire and dirt every day. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, 
and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, of, lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Thirdly, there's no rest in hell because of the great suffering that's found there. Verse 24, Luke 16, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Is there fire in hell? You know what some people say? The fire's not literal fire. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to ease your mind so they can lull you to the place where you go there. Let me give you an example of how I know there's fire in hell. Can I do that? Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. Look in verse 24 of Matthew 13. I know this is a parable, and I'm, I'm reading it for a reason, so I want you to read with me, okay? Matthew 13, look in verse 24. Everybody here, get your Bible and look with me. Matthew 13, verse number 24. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath, the ta hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou uh, then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest... While you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now you say, well, that don't mean anything to me. Look down in verse 37 when Jesus starts to explain what he's talking about. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. You see that? The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest, the end of the world, the reapers are the angels, the uh, uh, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity. And he shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now let me ask you something. He explained everything in that parable. He said, uh, "The sower and the field was the." Uh, he said, "The field, the sower was the son of man. The field was the world." He said, "The good seed were the children of the kingdom." He said, "The tares were the ch children of the wicked one." He said, "The enemy was the devil." He said, "The harvest was at the end of the world." He said, "The reapers were the angels." If the fire was something else, why didn't he say it was something else? He didn't say it was anything else but fire. Amen. In the context of that scripture, fire is still fire. It's a flame. It's a fire. It's a real fire. And listen to me. He wouldn't change it at the end and say, well, now we're going back to the parable and we're going to keep it a parable and not, uh, not explain the rest of it. He would have explained every bit of it. You know what people say? If, if hell had flames in it, it'd be light. It wouldn't be dark. Scientifically, just scientifically, some of you men know what I'm talking about. The worst flame you can ever touch is one you cannot see. They call it a dark flame. And it's hotter, and it'll burn you quicker than any other flame 
there is. Beside that, we're talking about God. We're not talking about man. But science tells you there's a flame that you cannot see. Amen? So we're talking about a place like no other place. We're talking about a place that God put there. Lastly, there's no enduring punishment like this place called hell. Let me read some scripture to you. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the heaven and the, uh, uh, the, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. The sea gave up the dead which uh, were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Amen. The enduring punishment of hell. Friend, we, we can't even describe forever and ever. We don't even know what that is. All, you know, Brother Gary, you've lived to be 60-some years old. I'm turning 50. And, you know, I'm, I've lived that 50 years. That's really all I know. Some of that I don't even know. I, I don't, you know, from 1 to 3, I can't remember much. I mean, from 0 to 3, I can't remember much. But you know what? The Bible says they'll be cast there forever and ever. You know what that means? It means no hope. You know what? If I were to tell you, Brother Ted, you're going to hell, and in three trillion years, there's going to be a door open and you can get out. You know what you've got? Hope. You've got some hope. Three trillion years from now, I'm going to get out. There's no three trillion years. Forever. And then he attached a little bit on the end and said, and ever. That means eternally. There's no hope. There's no hope. There's no God there. There's no God there. There's no exits there. There's no exit signs in hell. There's no, no door that says this way out because there's no way out. It's eternal. It's an enduring punishment let me give you this there's hope there's hope now there's no hope after you go there but there's hope now Amen. that's why we preach such things that's why we tell you such things that's why we bring you here it's because we want you to know there's hope now listen to this but God <laughs> commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. He took our place. We don't have to go to hell. Isn't that good news? Listen to this. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now. Come now. He didn't say come after a while. He didn't say wait. He said come now. Let us reason together. Saith the Lord, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Listen to this, John 1, 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave He <laughs> power to become the sons of God. Amen? Amen? Even to them that believe on His name. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. For He said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. That means... He has come to you. That's today. He's come to you. I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9. 
The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slack. But it's long-suffering, that means patient, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now I'm going to give you something real good here. It's not the Lord's will for you to die and go to hell. It's the Lord's will that you get saved this morning. And how you get saved this morning is heeding His call and coming. To who? Not to me, to Him. And receiving the gift that He's offering you. And that gift is His life in place for your life. And trusting in Him completely to get you to heaven. If you're not saved here this morning, you can be saved here this morning according to the Word of God. You know how I know that? Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will. Don't you like those words? Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If you'll come this morning, he'll save you. You don't have to go to hell this morning. But I'll tell you this. You keep waiting. Listen to me. Teenagers, listen to me. You keep waiting. And you're going to send away your day of grace. And you're going to end up in a place like that there's no other place like. And that place is called hell. It's real this morning. And if you're not saved this morning, you ought to come and take what he's offering. I'm going to ask everybody to stand them come get a song. Would you, take, would you take God serious this morning? Would you realize that He's sending you a message this morning? I'm going to say something else. Listen to, I want everybody to listen to me. Everybody look at me. There's people in this room this morning that's lost. Some of them are under conviction. Some of them are not. I'm asking you that are saved to come and present yourself a living sacrifice for them. You can't save them. You can't get them saved. But you can pray and ask God to convict them and show them. He's already died for them. Would you do that? Would you say, I'm going to pray for somebody this morning. I don't know who they are, but I'm coming. And I'm going to pray that somebody gets saved. The truth was told to them this morning. And they can come and they can be saved if they would. The offer's for you. Would you come? Would you come this morning, ask the Lord to save you? Amen. How about you? Don't stand here and walk out lost. How about you? you come this morning God loves you this morning I want you to be saved to would you come this morning Lord loves you he don't want you to go there would you come maybe you're here this morning you say preacher I would come but I don't know I don't know what to do I don't know what to say we'll meet you here I promise you, we'll meet you here if you just come. Would you come? Somebody here now and all with a Bible, they'll take the Bible and show you how to be saved. How about you? Would you come? Would you come? There's no place like hell. How about you?